the stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of The Whisper in Darkness. I'm your host, The Man from Lang. Thank you very much for joining me today. On this episode, we are continuing with our reviews of the player cards in the Scarlet Keys Investigator expansion. This is our look at the neutral cards. In this episode, we are going to discuss Tool Belt, Refine, Flashlight Level 3, and Soul Sanctification. There are spoilers throughout if you care about that sort of thing. If you enjoy what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Before we get started, a quick reminder of how we rate cards here on The Whisper in Darkness. The best of the best get an Elder Sign, while the worst of the worst get an Auto Fail, and the cards in between get a plus one, zero, or Elder Thing, respectively. Cards that you build around or cards that are good in one particular deck get a Bless Token, while cards that we believe are destined to end up on the list of taboos or are simply bad for the big game get a Curse Token. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the patrons of this channel for their tremendous support. You all rock! If you'd like to be amazing like these people and support the channel's goals and see your name on this list, head over to Patreon.com, sign up for a tier of your choice, and claim your rewards. That would be awesome. Special thanks to Cole Monroe Chitty, Nicole Fiscus, and Nate Lost in Time and Space for their contributions to the channel. I couldn't do it without you. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome back everyone to our reviews of the player cards in the Scarlet Keys Investigator expansion. We are going to take a look at the neutral cards in uh, this episode. We're going to start things off with Tool Belt. It is a two cost asset with a willpower skill icon, item and clothing trait. Each attached asset takes up no slots and its text box is treated as if it were blank except for traits. As a free triggered ability, you can exhaust Tool Belt, choose one, attach a tool asset in your play area to Tool Belt, switch a tool asset in your play area with an attached asset, or detach an attached asset. Tool Belt takes up a body slot. So there are about 40 tools in the game in all classes, except Mi Mystic. Mystics don't have any tools. At least five of those tools are signatures three of which are in this box. You have, uh, I believe, the Bone Saw for Vincent, the Grappling Hook for Kaimani, and uh, Daryl's Camera are all tools. What do you think about this one? So this is, so I guess this is kind of like, you know, Bandolier for, um, but for tools. So I admit decks like, like cards like this, I do have an initial reservation about them because it leads to the problem of you have to draw the tool belt before you, you know, before you can play all your tools. And if you don't draw your tool belt, then your whole tool belt deck isn't going to work and you're going to run out of hand slots. Bandolier suffers from this same problem as well. Say you want to have a two-handed weapon and a magnifying glass. Well, you got to draw the bandolier and play the bandolier before you can put your magnifying glass down or else you're going to run out of slots. So I admit I do have an initial reservation about it. So yeah, with tool belt though, let's take a look at the tools, shall we? I think that would give us ideas um, of what we would use it for. I want to look for a tool layout. What combination of tools is worth like four hand slots and is worth actually playing two belt for. So, I mean, um, we look at it already and we see things like you got like Daryl's Kodak, Cryptographic Cipher. These are useful for, um, you know, like clue discovery. And then I guess you can combine, you can like have weapons in the offhand. So here's a question, Mr. Lang, like what do you need be besides just a clue getting tool and like a weapon? Like what would be the third hand slot yeah, I've seen the, the use case for this being like, say you have your clue discovery tool in one hand and your two-handed weapon mm -hmm. in the other, and so you're swapping between the two of those. So you use your you use your clue discovery tool and then you swap to your two-handed weapon when you need to fight. My issue with that is that if I'm using a two-handed weapon, I am usually using some other way to discover clues besides another tool. Sure. So I'm using, I'm cheating clues using events or stuff yeah. like that. So I don't need the tool belt to help me yeah. in that case. This is especially true in Survivor who have plenty of ways of, of cheating clues. Perhaps not in, in so much in other classes, but definitely Survivor has all sorts of things that they can do to, to get clues without needing actual hand slots to, to use yeah. tools. Yeah, I'm looking over to the tools right now, and yeah, most of them, most of the tools just seem to fall into the category of being like clue tools. So I guess here's a question. So you have magnifying glass, which does a thing even without activating it. Like, do you think magnifying glass alone is worth packing to tool belt? No, I. No. Okay. No, I mean, I've, I have seen some people propose like tricky plays, like okay, I've got two copies of lock picks. 
So one on my tool oh, belt, and you can, one on right. my person, so I can swap the two. So you you're basically them. getting two lock picks per turn. Or but you can again, just play two lock picks and have that be your two hand slots. And yeah. but see, that's never been really an issue yeah. with me, where it's like, okay, yeah. I need two uses of lock picks per turn, because again, I'm playing other cards to get me those clues that I need, and so I don't yeah. need something like this in order to facilitate that i guess is the so the the so the tools that i'm looking at now beyond your weapon and your um clue tool what are some like really really like esoteric tools that could be like situationally useful i'm thinking like pocket telescope you know potentially very useful and you know situationally to a lesser extent ice pick no that's just good in general that's your clue tool Let's see. But you got the grappling hook. You've got um I can see Silas is a net justifying going on there because that's an evasion tool. Yes, there's not a lot of tools that I think just that from looking around here seem to justify like adding a whole nother card and having to draw that whole nother card. But it's one of those where I'm glad it's in the game, much like Bandolier. So you're not it's not like a showstopper, you know, the fact that you have this deck and you have like six hand slot items and you know you want to play them i can see a lot of like synergy if you want to go down the geared up strategy you know where you play a lot of items so i can see that working out yeah other than that it seems pretty it seems very specific to a deck that probably doesn't need to load up that much but if you do you've got the option yeah i think when i was looking through the list of tools i sort of ran into the same situation that you did where i'm like okay so i'm playing tool belt for what tools why do i need this and nothing really jumped out at me as as being like okay here's here's the thing i'm using tool belt for i was like well i'm mm -hmm. sort of if i'm going to play these tools i'm not going to get all tricksy with them i'm just going to use them and go from there although there's some hilarious chainsaw and uh sledgehammer you know illustrations there you can have you know you got the chainsaw on your belt yeah i mean i think that might be the for me anyway, like using a two handed weapon and solo can be somewhat challenging. True. Yeah. So maybe tool belt mm -hmm. helps out in that circumstance. It is it is nice that the swap is is a free triggered ability, so True. you're not losing any actions doing that. So mm -hmm. how would you rate this one? Okay. Given that you can't play items directly tool directly on the tool belt. Okay, so you got to do some juggling to get it started. Okay, and it's pretty specific. Okay, so we're looking like so we're looking at a situation where you're like solo or two player maybe, and so you, where you like need to have all three things going. Wow, this is pretty specific, but I don't think it's like this isn't like make the whole deck work. This isn't a bless. I'm glad it's in the game though, so I'm gonna give it a zero for what it does. It's not gonna go in a lot of decks, but it does do what it does pretty efficiently. Like, unlike Bandolier, you get your one hand slot and that's it. Okay, and then you still might have to do some juggle if you want to, like, push it to the limit. But at least with Tool Belt, like, you could stow an infinite amount of tools on there if you really want to. So it's a little less... Yeah, it's a little less um, fiddly than, like, Bandolier. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a zero. Like, I wouldn't play this very often. Although, uh, I'm kind of liking the uh, synergy with Crafty, you know, to use your... Uh use your tools you know with plus two every turn that seems like fun yeah i'll give it a zero i'm gonna go elder thing on this one i don't know if i'll ever play this card to be honest mm -hmm. it it seems to solve a problem that i haven't really had now maybe yeah. i haven't played a, a dedicated tool deck but the list of tools hasn't really inspired me to do that either so i could see playing this in that deck, if if you're really going all in on tools, then this yeah. might give you a solution to that. But I think for the most part, if if it's just to swap between, say, your fighting tool and your investigating tool, I have other solutions to that problem that don't involve mm -hmm. to that don't rely on tool belt. So this card just won't. I just won't play it. So. The next card is Refine. It is a three cost event with willpower and agility skill icons, supply and double trait. 
As an additional cost to play Refine, spend an action, immediately mark a checkbox on an upgrade sheet for a customizable card you own, even if it is not in play, max once per game for each investigator. So you're essentially spending a card, three resources, and two actions for one XP on a uh, customizable card. Unlike the other uh, XP generating cards in this game, you get the XP immediately. So if your hunter's armor wasn't doing something before, suddenly it is doing that thing. That may be relevant, it may not be. Now I was looking at to some of the decks that were playing the customizable cards, and this one seemed to be a two of in, in most of those decks. I feel like this one is a lot easier to pull off in multiplayer than, than in solo, though, simply because of that two action tax. That is pretty significant in a, in a solo game. I just usually don't have the time to commit mm -hmm. to that sort, of, uh, that sort of strategy. What do you think about this one? I would absolutely never play two of this because you can only play it once per game. So like if you draw the second copy it is complete it's useless except for the icons. Plus most classes have like XP generating cards so like would you play this over Delve Too Deep? Probably not. Would you play this over let God sort them out? Probably not. Yeah, like it's really it's it's expensive and it's slow. The one thing it does have going for it is that it has the supply tree. So you can attach it on your stick to the plant, you know, for Guardian which is a very XP hungry, you know, class. And you can find it with uh, Backpack Level 2. So it's got that going for it. And I do like the, the case where you attach it on your stick to the plan, and then you never have to worry about like getting a dead draw. If you manage to get a chance to play Refine, you play the Refine and then you're good. You don't have to worry about drawing it and it being a dead draw for you. So that's I think that's the one thing it has going for it. Other than that, I, I'm personally not a big fan of... like trying to break the XP curve, unless it's Sharon's Oval, because then it's hilarious. The The thing that really kind of annoys me about this card is that, once again, here we have a card that generates XP, which is easier to play in multiplayer, where you need you don't really need as much XP, because you have true. easier have ways to get it. I mean, you could. it's like, yeah. okay, the four of us are just going to go to all the Victory Point locations and kill all the Victory Point monsters, so we're already getting more XP than the than the solo player is. So it's really the solo player who needs the help catching up on the XP. And here's another card that they just that really doesn't help. Yeah, that it kind really of brings me. us back to some of our discussions in the past about XP boosting cards. Like in the thick of it, for example. Oh, I hate that card so much because it's so it's just so easy to play. I really wish in the thick of it was like true solo only. Because true solo needs the help. And multiplayer doesn't you're just trying to lap the scenario at that point so yeah i would like never play this but i think it's like costed enough it's costed like high enough mainly in the two actions that it's like i don't want to i don't think it's like breaking the game given that xp effects already exist and are okay how would you rate this one um for the most part i'd say elder thing but i will asterisk that by saying i do like the use case of putting it on your stick to the plan even in a solo guardian because you're, there's no real cost to that. Like, yeah, you know, because Stick to the Plan already is pretty good for having situational events on it anyway. So you put it on your Stick to the Plan, and if you happen to get a chance to play Refine, even as a solo Guardian, good, you play it and you get an XP for it. But if you don't get a chance, you don't lose anything. So I'd say Elder Thing, except and with that asterisk. I'm going to go Elder Thing as well. I... I will probably not a lot. play this. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I will probably not play this card. It's just way too resource and action intensive uh, for yeah. me. I think there are probably even better options to stack on Stick to the Plan than oh, a card that oh. I'm hoping I'm going to cross my fingers, <laughs> hope that <laughs> I find two actions at some point in the game where I can take the foot off the gas and and basically do nothing for a turn to gain an XP that I have to spend on a on a customizable card. It's not like you're just right. getting a, a generic XP that you can spend on anything. You have to spend it on a customizable card, which means you're playing customizable cards, and then you have to... And then it really depends on what you're getting for that XP mm -hmm. in terms of, of the customizables. So 
Unlikely that I will uh, be playing this one, but uh, if you are playing customizable cards and you uh, have some customizable card that you need to spend six, seven, eight, nine, ten XP on, and you're playing in multiplayer, then this will uh, help you reach that uh, reach that level. But then again, if you have the time to spend two actions and three resources, if you're, if you're do if your your team is doing that well, do you really need the XP at that point? You're already beating the game. You're probably doing pretty well if you uh, yeah. if you have the resources and time to uh, to spend on yeah. this thing. So maybe a little bit of a win more. Win more. That's exactly my thought. Without that was the word I could not find. The next card is Flashlight Level 3. It is a two-cost asset with a uh, intellect and agility skill icon, item, and tool trait. Uses four supplies as a reaction when you perform a skill test while investigating or attempting to evade. Supply, spend one supply. This test gets minus two difficulty, and it uh, takes up a hand slot. This card was designed by the Council in Exile at uh, Arkham Knights uh, 2020. So this has some uh, some big differences between this and its uh, level zero counterpart from uh, the core set. You get an extra agility skill icon, which is sort of expected given that uh, you can now help evade with this one. And you can use it to evade and not just investigate. Perhaps the, the most significant difference is that this is now a reaction and not an action, yeah. which is pretty huge because now this works with all the other investigate cards, which was one of the downsides of Flashlight. It was like, okay, you need to take an action to use the Flashlight, and it didn't combo with any of the other cards you had. Now this one does. Obviously, this synergizes with the uh, Difficulty Zero decks that uh, Daryl, among others, are interested in playing. I guess the only downside I can see to this one is that uh, you're spending 3 XP, which is pretty significant, but you're not getting any extra clues out of the deal. So unlike some of the other XP cards at this level, you're I think you're really paying for that, uh, that evade. What do you think about this one? I agree. Also, one thing that's worth noting is you do get a fourth supply out of it, which is true. not completely insignificant. Okay, so you, so you get an additional charge and you can stack it with other investigate tools all right yeah so of course i'm thinking back to my uh my good friend fingerprint kit for example yeah so this kind, so this kind of thing kind of goes along with um a lot of the decks i like to play very generalist decks um and i like how this flashlight upgrade it's also pretty generalist because you can use it on evasion as well as um investigation if you're even if you're playing like a full-on seeker like without trying to do the difficulty zero stuff i like how this act acts as a defensive tool because there are a decent amount of enemies with low evade scores. You can use this flashlight to like zero out an evade test, which is actually pretty nice. You know, so you don't have to like rely on someone else to engage the enemy off of you. Like that's pretty good, I'd say. That being said, X three XP is a bit steep. I think I think this has a pretty powerful effect. Would I put it in like every deck? Actually, I would consider it. I would consider this in a lot of decks, actually. It's really cheap at two resources. And has a pretty universal effect, both offensive, you know, as in discovering clues, and defensive, as in dealing with with enemies. So this is like a pretty nice card. It's a little expensive XP wise, which kind of gives me pause, but I don't really have any complaints about this. Yeah, plus I like the idea of being able to like combo this with winging it, you know, to like zero out the to zero out the shroud, and then you just gain two clues that way and the reason why i say winging it is because that's a very low effort clue acceleration tool because you just you literally play it out of the discard you don't have to spend any actions putting down assets you have to like you don't really have to commit to it so if i already have a flashlight just for like the evasion you know and then i then i can just throw winging it out there that's kind of nice actually yeah, I have like no complaints about this card. I think it's actually like pretty decent. Yeah, I really like the fact that this is a reaction now. I I think back yeah. to playing where Doom awaits, and uh, oh, how right. you have to take the action <laughs> on the location card right. in order to get the clues, yeah. and you can't use flashlight on that. And so, if you are relying on flashlight to get you clues, suddenly 
that location is a is a very Probably. significant barrier to your deck and yeah. flashlight level three helps with that a great deal yeah. which is uh which is nice between this and guard dog i think the council and exile did a pretty good job so it turns out that we, there was an upside to the pandemic we got good community design cards that's true some of the community design cards are uh collecting dust in my uh my box so uh oh i've been playing burn after reading lately I like Burn After Reading. It's very, it's, uh, it's, I've been playing it lately. I mm -hmm. like it. How would you uh, rate Flashlight Level 3? So I have no complaints about this card. I think it's pretty good. But given that it's 3 XP, I think that knocks it down to a zero for me. I think it's fine. I think it does what it does. It's a little pricey XP wise. So I wouldn't be like in a hurry to place it in decks. But I, I think it's pretty good. So um, I'll give it a zero. Yeah, I think the, the 3 XP cost on this one knocks it down to a zero for me as well. I'd really like to give this one a plus one. And I think if it cost 2 XP, it would be an easy plus oh, yeah. one, which might be oh, yeah. part of the problem. Because then <laughs> suddenly it, it becomes ubiquitous. Obviously, if you're playing a difficulty zero deck, this one is probably oh, well, you know plus one absolutely necessary possibly yeah. higher possibly even elder sign territory for that one mm -hmm. but yeah i mean you get extra supply you get an extra evade there's really not uh, not a great deal to uh, complain about uh, with this one and uh, hey it uh, synergizes with tool belt as well so uh, if you want That's to right. uh, if you're looking for high quality tools I would recommend this. Uh, I would this say that. Flashlight it is a high quality tool. Yeah, high quality. To, uh, Great to stack on your tool belt. The final neutral card in the box is Soul Sanctification. It is a, a permanent asset that costs 3 XP. It is also exceptional, so it will cost you 6 XP. It has the ritual trait. For every point of damage and or horror you heal in excess of an investigator's current damage or horror, Place one resource on Soul Sanctification as an offering. This still counts as healing as a free triggered ability. You may spend one offering. You get plus two skill value for this test. Limit twice per test. So this is, uh, I guess, something of a capstone for those uh, investigators who are interested in healing, either uh, damage or horror. So if you're playing somebody like Carolyn, or Vincent, who uh, naturally lend themselves to healing uh, horror or damage in that case. This can provide up to plus four on uh, any skill test, which is pretty significant as a free triggered ability, which is nice. It only heals, it only benefits you if you're healing investigators. You can't use this to yes. heal allies, which uh, well, may be a, a knock, very good reason for that. May be a knock because... against it. There's a really good reason for that, though, um, because the way you read it, because it's OK, so it's an excess. All right. Here's the thing. Technically, you can trigger Peter Sylvester if he has no horror on him. It just doesn't do anything. But if they left off the investigator word here, then healing Peter Sylvester, even when he has no horror on him, would do something. And I think that alone is probably why they had to specify investigator. Yeah. So I've made it pretty clear what I think about most of the healing cards in this game. Here's a card that rewards you for playing all of those cards or just playing a healing strategy. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what to think about this one. I mean, the benefit is pretty good. I can see the, the pros to being in that situation where you're going to be healing everybody anyway and some investigators are going to benefit more. And if you do end up overhealing, you get some benefit in the end to help you on any skill test, which is certainly certainly valuable. I can also see the argument where that people have made that it's like, well, why are you wasting your time overhealing in the first place? Which is sort of where I because would probably land <laughs> on this one. If well, you're if you've got the time to overheal, then you're already doing pretty well. Okay, so let's consider this the scenario, which comes up a strange amount. Let's say you're, you've got a uh, got a hallowed mirror on the board, and you've got your um, soothing melody in hand. With this on the board, 
even if it does nothing. It is zero resources, spend an action, draw a card, gain plus four to a skill test. That's not bad. Like, that's pretty decent because that's like four, almost like four resources worth of, uh, you know, worth of benefit. You know, if you want to like use the one resource equals plus one scale, like that's pretty good. That's like just perfect, you know, for, you know, value for actions there. So what this does is this takes away the downside of playing healing at all for the most part is that you might end up in a situation where you're over healing. But in that case, you've got soul sanctification coming in to like save you. So it means you don't have any wasted effort anymore. You don't have dead draws. I think that's where they're going with this. I admit three, uh, six XP is a lot though, but at least what this does is it like takes away the punishment of like trying to help your follow, fellow man, which, which is pretty good. I'd say I like, I like this card kind of, it spawns new builds and it's another one of those great cards that I really like because it makes me go back and think of cards in a new light. You know what I mean? I like it when cards do that. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a bit of a, at a loss with this one simply because as a solo player, I'm not usually playing a dedicated healing deck. And even if I was to play in multiplayer, I'm probably not the one who's playing the, the dedicated healing deck. So it's hard for me to judge exactly how good this card is. I mean, I do like the, the ability you get out of it. So that's a plus. So even in like a solo situation, this doesn't seem that bad because those offerings can be spent for any test. So like of any attribute, which is pretty nice. That being said, six XP is a lot, you know, for like a solo player. That is a, a very steep cost, especially mm -hmm. in solo where you simply yeah. tend to gain less XP than you do in, in multiplayer. So. Yeah. Spending six XP on something like this, it would really have to ratchet up your deck. You might be able to get to the point where you have enough of a healing engine built up that you're getting plus two on every skill test you take, which is a lot because you're generating that many offerings. You know, because it's for every point that you overheal, that's pretty good. So, how would you rate this one? Yeah, I th I think uh, it's specific enough that it's a bless because you can build around this. I think if, especially the easy ones are Carolyn and Vincent, because I noticed they fiddled the language enough to make it really good for Carolyn and Vincent, because note how they have that sentence at the end, this still counts as healing. So that means that you can trigger Carolyn and Vincent on someone who's fully healed where you couldn't before because you couldn't heal damage that didn't exist, that didn't exist. Well, you could, but it wouldn't count as healing. But now that this makes it count as healing, it's like, okay, so anything else that triggers off of healing suddenly works here. So yeah, this this is a really specific. I think it makes the build. I think it, uh, and I and I like how it um, kind of opens up other cards that you know we used to play and well, not used to play, sorry, that we overlooked. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of fun that could be had here. Yeah, this one gets a bless from me as well. I. I don't see myself ever playing this outside of a either a dedicated healing horror or damage deck. Mm -hmm. I think you could probably play around with it in in other types of builds, but to me, yeah. that's like if you're looking for skill test bonuses, I think there are probably easier ways to get it than spending six XP and True having that healing architecture in your deck in order to to fire it it's something that's worth that might be worth uh looking at here because i'm starting to think all right what if i had a build that wasn't really a heal build but had enough incidental healing so i'm thinking things like um one of the upgrades of runic axe lets you heal a da like lets you heal a damage or horror when you defeat an enemy i wonder if it's possible to generate to have like enough incidental healing that you can use sanct soul sanctification to basically power up your skill tests just incidentally. Oh, fearless. Like you play fearless in, um, you know, as like a skill card heals you a horror. Okay. So I add a willpower to a test, heal myself a horror that I don't have, and then get a plus two to it to, you know, an upcoming test. I, I think there might be something there. 
And Mystics have plenty of XP left over after they down the rabbit hole arcane. Oh, yeah. Arcane yeah. research and they, everything. Or down the rabbit hole. And now they've got, um, I mean, of course, they've got in the thick of it because, you know, so broken. And, um, and, and now they've got, what's it, refine to refine their living ink to make their tattoos more intricate. That's going to do it for our look at the neutral cards in the Scarlet Keys Investigator expansion. Let us know in the comments down below what you think. Any uh, final thoughts, uh, Matastrophic? Some actually some pretty good neutral cards in, in this batch. I, uh, I always like to see neutral cards because they tend to open up builds in, in a whole variety of investigators rather than just uh, restricted to class. And uh, we certainly have a, a few good ones here. I think the flashlight level three, that that's, I like that. They did a pretty good job with that one. That and I like how uh, Soul Sanctification like opens up new strategies. I mean, I'm not the biggest. Also, I'm not the biggest fan of Tool Belt, but I'm glad it exists. So, um, yeah, I'm glad it's there. It lets you do that, even if it's even if it's not something I personally would do very often. Not a big fan of Refine, though. I'm not a big fan of exp of like win more xp cards in general that's gonna do it for this episode if you enjoy what you hear remember to like comment and subscribe if you need to contact me i can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com i'm also on twitter at manfromlang until the stars are right keep your shotgun close and your elder sign closer take care out there and happy investigating